Declaration of C. Name redacted. I, C, hereby declare as follows. I have personal knowledge of the facts set forth below, and if called to testify, I could and would do so competently. My name is C. I was born on January 24, 1984, in Guatemala. I am seeking asylum with my wife and our five children. We are currently subject to the Remain in Mexico, or MPP, program. We are obligated to remain in Mexico while we go through our immigration proceedings. The lawyer representing us in our immigration proceedings is Stephanie Blumberg. My wife and I have five children, a four-year-old son, nine-year-old son, ten-year-old son, twelve-year-old son, and a seventeen-year-old daughter. My seventeen-year-old daughter is not my biological daughter, but I have raised her and I love her as my daughter. Not even my sons know she is not my biological daughter. In Guatemala, my family was extorted by cartel members. We did not respond to their extortion. Horribly, those same individuals raped my daughter and threatened to kill her. They told her it was my fault because I had not paid the extortion. After suffering the rape and death threat, my daughter fell into a depression. She would not leave the house, she would hardly speak, and she expressed thoughts of ending her life. We decided to flee Guatemala in April of 2019. At the end of April 2019, my family was en route to the United States. In Arriaga, Chiapas, Mexico, three men assaulted us and robbed us at gunpoint. We think they were federal officers due to how they were dressed. They wore a shirt with the Mexican flag, and their faces were covered with scarves. All three were armed. They robbed us of all the money we had, even the money I had hid in my wife's purse. They forced us all to undress, even my children. They hit me on the neck with a gun and then had me at gunpoint. The only thing I said to them was to take what they wanted but to leave me and my children. I thought if I made any movements they could kill me, and possibly my wife and children also, and end everything right there. I felt horrible not being able to protect my family, as if I had completely failed. Our attackers told us if we reported what had happened they would find out and kill us. We were left with hardly anything. When I found a coin worth fifty cents, one of my sons hopefully told me, Dad, with that we can buy water for everyone. After, when we were finally on a bus en route to Tijuana from Mexico City, federal officers stopped the bus. An armed officer, dressed in dark-colored pants, a white polo shirt, and wearing a nude-colored hat, got on the bus. He asked me, How many? I did not understand his question. He yelled at me, Don't pretend to be a dumbass. How many are with you? I told him that my wife, five children, and I were together. He asked to see my documents and for my wallet. That officer took 500 Mexican pesos from my wallet. He asked us if our children were ours. I thought he might take my children away. I told him he could ask my children himself and that they would tell him the truth. When the officer got off the bus, we continued our route. After that, I could not relax. I did not feel at ease, and I could not sleep. I again realized that we could not trust the Mexican authorities. Soon after, we arrived in Tijuana. On or about August 8th, we were arrested by U.S. immigration officers. We immediately requested asylum. We were all taken to the Chula Vista Border Patrol Station. Once inside, I was separated from my wife and children. I was detained in a dirty cell. There was a window, but you could not see out. I was not given a toothbrush or toothpaste. When I asked an officer if I could grab mine from my luggage, he ignored me and slammed the cell door in my face. To eat, we were given bean burritos that smelled rotten. The cell where I was detained was cold, and they forced me to take off my jacket and the shirt I had on top of my undershirt. At first, when I had only taken off my jacket, the officer asked me, Are you a dumbass? I said, Take it off, and demanded that I take off my shirt as well. During the entire time that I was detained, I never saw my wife or children. The night I spent in the cell, I did not sleep. I felt without strength, and I did not know what to do. 
I worried about my children, if they had eaten, if they had blankets, and if they were treating them well. The immigration officers never gave me information regarding my wife or children. The following morning, an officer came into the cell and told me that I would be returned to Mexico. My wife and children were released with me. While I was detained, the immigration officers never asked me about my fear of returning to Mexico. Our first court date was scheduled for September 3rd, 2019, at 8 in the morning. In Tijuana, we attempted to find a lawyer. We called different people from the list that immigration gave us. We attended a workshop in Tijuana for migrants seeking asylum. In Tijuana, it has been very difficult to find housing and to provide for my children due to lack of work. I have not even been able to pay for my children to see a doctor or dentist. One of my sons is very sick and another is in a lot of pain because of a molar that needs a dentist's attention. On September 2, 2019, we had not secured transportation to take us to the port of entry on time for our court hearing. We had to be at the port of entry at 3 in the morning to make it to our court hearing at 8 in the morning. We searched for a hotel close to the port of entry, but they charged 1,500 Mexican pesos. We do not have that much money, and it has been extremely difficult to find work in Tijuana. With no other option, we decided to spend the night in front of the port of entry in Tijuana. We arrived there at 9 at night on September 2nd. That night I did not sleep to protect my family. I had to be on watch the entire night to make sure no one was going to harm us. My children slept on the street without a blanket. We used our sweaters to cover them. I feel that my children have lost a year of their lives going through this entire process. On September 3rd, at 3 in the morning, we were allowed to enter the port of entry. We were all tired. We were processed and registered. After, we were taken to the court. When we arrived at court, they put us in a waiting room before being allowed to enter the courtroom. There was a lot of people, everyone waiting for their case, just like us. The courtroom was filled with people. All of us were waiting for the judge. When the judge arrived, he spoke with everyone in the courtroom. He explained our rights and that he would reschedule our hearings. He gave us a lot of information, but it was difficult to pay attention. My children were all very tired. They could hardly keep their eyes open. My nine-year-old son asked me to carry him in my arms so he could sleep. He told me he did not want to be in jail. At the end of the hearing, the judge asked everyone who feared returning to Mexico. My wife and I raised our hands. After court, we were returned to the port of entry before being transferred to the Chula Vista Border Patrol Station, where we were originally detained. Upon arrival, I was again separated from my wife and children. This time, I saw how they mistreat people in the holding cells. I saw one officer push an older man's head into the trash can after the man had thrown something away in the trash. I told the officer he should respect the man because he was of older age, and the officer told me, Shut up, motherfucker! That day I was not given dinner. That same day an officer came to my cell and called me by name. He ordered me to turn and face the cell wall, put my hands behind my back, and he handcuffed me. The handcuffs were so tight they hurt my wrists. The officer took me to a small, windowless room. In the room there was a table, chairs, and a telephone. Two officers were waiting for me on the telephone. One asked me questions in English and the other translated. The officer that brought me to the room, together with another officer who was dressed in green, took a seat inside the room and were present for my interview. I did not feel comfortable responding to the questions that they asked me over the phone with those officers present. The officers distracted me. They would speak in English to each other and would laugh. I do not know what they said, but it was very difficult to navigate it all. The officer over the phone asked me to raise my hand to swear in, but I told him I could not because the handcuffs were so tight. I went through the entire interview handcuffed. Halfway through the interview, there was a change in shift, and the two officers left the room and another entered to be present for my interview. I know that the officers in the room were listening to the interview because at one point during the interview, one of the officers responded to something that I said. The officers were staring at me during the entire interview. 
The interview was a horrible experience. They only let me respond to questions with a yes or no. I was not allowed to give explanations. With so much movement surrounding me, so much pressure and with my nerves, I forgot basic details and I did not say everything that I wanted to. I noticed that in a moment like that, one wrong detail can cost you your life. The next day, an officer entered my cell and told me I would be returned to Mexico. I did not know if my wife or children would be returned with me, if they had been given an interview or where they were. I was never given an explanation or told what the results of the interview were. They made me sign some documents and returned me to Mexico along with my wife and children. Our next court date was scheduled for October 17, 2019. Again in Mexico, around the end of September 2019, I was assaulted in Tijuana. I was en route to a possible job. They asked me to arrive at 7.30 at night and to use black clothing. I thought I was going to work as a night security guard. On my way, I was assaulted by three armed men who were dressed in black. Two had a gun and showed them to me. One cocked his gun and placed it on my back. They took away some immigration documents that I had with me. They robbed me of 320 Mexican pesos. I decided not to file a police report. After what happened to us on our way to Tijuana, I do not trust the Mexican authorities. A lot of our neighbors tell us that we cannot go to the police because one cannot trust them due to corruption. On October 10th of 2019, attorney Stephanie Blumberg called us to let us know that she could represent us in our immigration proceeding. I hope that with her help we can get out of this situation. On October 17th, our lawyer Stephanie was present at our court hearing. She asked the judge for more time to prepare our case. We did not tell the judge about our fear of returning to Mexico. Our next court date is scheduled for November 5th, 2019, at 8 in the morning. I understand that at our next court, we can ask for, we can ask for another fear of return to Mexico interview and that we might have to be sent back to the holding cell. Even though my children have begged me not to return there, I feel it is necessary due to the severity of our situation in Mexico. I worry that without Stephanie at the interview with us, we will not be able to communicate our fear. I would like to have her there so she can explain if we do not know the questions, and she could help us better explain our fear. I fear that my family will not pass the interview, and that we will again be obligated to return to Mexico, where our lives are in danger. I would like for my family's identity to remain private. If it was publicly known who we are, it could be very dangerous for us. No one in Guatemala knows that we are in Tijuana. People know that we left for the U.S., but that is the extent of it. I fear that if our names were made public, the cartels we escaped from could send for someone to kill me and my family. I declare under penalty of perjury of the laws of the United States of America that the foregoing is true and correct. Signed this October 24, 2019, in San Diego, California.